so uh, I'm going to read from Luke 15, verses 11 to 24. It's the parable, or part of the parable of the prodigal son. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's servants have bread enough to spare, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Lord of mercy and compassion, we thank you for your great uh, patience with us. And we ask that you give us the same patience with others and with ourselves. Give us the grace to come to you in the sacraments of healing. And allow you to embrace us, forgive us. And fill us with your hope. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that parable is a really wonderful parable, especially for our topic today, because it shows us how merciful and how loving God is. Um, if you didn't know, in, in those times, a father or a man would really never run. It was kind of a humiliating thing to, to be seen running. Um, but in that story, as we can see, the father doesn't care. He loves his son so much that he comes running to him. And uh, and that's what God does for us in the sacraments of healing. Um, And so I thought that would be a good way to start this uh, this topic. So before we get started, um, what have you guys heard of from others or um, just kind of heard about Catholics and the sacrament of penance? Of course, we're going to talk about penance, which is the same thing as confession, by the way. Um, So what things have you guys heard about the sacrament of confession? Maybe some objections. Anybody? Confessing to a priest instead of God. Yeah, why would we confess to a priest instead of God, right? What's something else? I know when I was um, looking at the Catholic Church, confession was kind of scary for me. I, I wanted to do it because I thought it would be good uh, for me psychologically and spiritually, um, but but I also was nervous about telling someone all of my deepest um, all of my deepest sins and horrible things that I've done throughout my whole life. I was not excited about that part at all. Um, and I also, like I said, I also did want to do it because I thought there was something good about it. Um, but something that I, I made a parallel with was in, in the Protestant church, we talked a lot about accountability partners. And I think, in a big way, the priest is kind of an accountability partner, right? Um, It's it's a way also of us to confess our sins, to put them out there, kind of uh, speak them into existence, so to speak, and uh, and confront them and and be forgiven of them. Um, So what is the sacrament of penance? The the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1422, it says, This is the sacrament by which we obtain pardon from God's mercy, for the offense committed against him, and are at the same time reconciled with the church, which we have wounded by our sins. So, this is interesting because lots of times we tend to think that sin is pretty private. If I commit a sin, 
um, depending on what it is, I guess, but uh, some of them we think are, are private, but uh, the church tells us no. All of our sins separate us from God and affect the community. Uh, I mean, this would be really obvious, like in a sin like murder, right? If you murder someone, uh, you take away their life, so that affects them, it affects their family, um, and as well as yourself. Um, and, and so sin affects ourselves and it affects everybody in the community. So, so reconciliation or confession reconciles us to the church and to God. Um, and then also, as you've already seen, this sacrament has lots of names. In the Catechism it says it's called the Sacrament of Penance, the Sacrament of Confession, the Sacrament of Conversion, Reconciliation, um, and the Sacrament of Forgiveness as well. And I think there might be one more, but, um, but each one, the point is each one emphasizes a different aspect of the sacrament, right? So if we're talking about confession, which is usually what we, we as Catholics call this sacrament, um, it's emphasizing the part where we confess our sins to the priest and to God, right? Um, if we call it the sacrament of penance, it emphasizes the part where we um, do penance and try to make satisfaction for the sins that we have committed, right? So, um, so each part just, or each name just emphasizes a different aspect uh, of the sacrament. Um, but I'll probably talk about reconciliation and confession mostly um, in this talk, so, um, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so the next question that we might have about the sacrament, like uh, I think you've said before, maybe I'm confusing with family catechesis, but um, each sacrament is instituted by Christ, right? Because uh, the definition that we gave was uh, sacrament is a, an inward reality and an outward, I mean, Outward sign of an inward reality instituted by Christ's good grace, right? So it's instituted by Christ. So where can we see that um, in the scriptures? Um, and really that happens in John 20, verses 22 and 23. And so I'm going to read to you just a little tiny excerpt from there. Um, and this will also kind of answer the question that Roman brought up about why do we have to confess, or really why, why will a priest, or why can't a priest listen to our confession, you know, what gives him the right to know the, the sins that we've committed, right? So, he likes to know all your business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Father. <laughs> um, so Jesus at this time, he, he appears, and he's died and resurrected, and he appears to the apostles and he says, um, peace be with you, right? And as the Father sent me, even so I send you. And in verse 22, he says, when, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so this, the church sees, is, is the time that, that Jesus um, gave the priests of our church and the bishops the authority to hear confessions and to forgive sins. Right? And, and so it's not really, but it's not really the priest who's doing it, right? It's Jesus who's forgiving us through the priest. The priest is what we call in persona Christi, as he is in all of the sacraments. Uh, so he's standing in the person of Christ. Um, and then also we can see in James chapter 5, verse 16, um, we can see that in the early church, the Christians would confess their sins to one another uh, because it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Uh, the prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. So, so we know that the early church um, had this practice of confessing, or that everybody confessed their sins uh, back in the early church. And um, actually, I think we're very blessed right now because <laughs> in the early church, uh, they would confess out loud during Mass. So we know like when we do the penitential rite of mass, and uh, usually we do the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, but there's also uh, the prayer where we say, I confess to all my God and to all my brothers, continue my brothers and sisters that I greatly sin, and so on and so forth. Well, in the early church, they actually list the sins that they committed, so thank goodness we don't have to do that, right? <laughs> um, although that might even hold us uh, more accountable. Um, it might be more helpful for our spiritual life, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yes? Remember in that, in that, Penitential right, it's the uh, uh, venial sins that we confess, not the mortal sins. 
Yeah, yeah. Right now, uh, yes, it is the venial sins that are uh, forgiven. Um, and yeah, define, and I'll talk about that. Are you going to define venial versus mortal sins? Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to get into it. So we're going to talk about mortal sins and venial sins and uh, purgatory, which is why I have. Well, that's our confession, by the way. Um, so St. the uh, Nave, the, the church is on the right there, and then on the left is the door to the, um, the confessional. Sorry about the order of the pictures. I just did a slideshow. There's purgatory, so we're going to talk about purgatory. That's what I was trying to show you. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then there's another depiction of purgatory uh, showing the mass, which I think is really cool. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so does anybody have any questions so far? We talked about the authority that Jesus gave to the apostles and to, by extension, the bishops and the priests uh, to forgive sins. Anybody have any questions on that? Also note that uh, Jesus, or actually God breathing throughout the whole of the scriptures is really um, important. Uh, God, every time he breathes, he gives up his life. Uh, the first time we hear about it is uh, with Adam, when he brings Adam to life. Right? So he breathes uh, life into the man. Um, and we, we see it throughout the scriptures, and this is one of the places where we see it with Jesus. So it's very important. Um, so then the next part, well, why, why do we even need reconciliation? Um, you know, that was actually one of the other questions I always had. Like, well, okay, I was baptized. Um, why do I need to be forgiven of sins that I commit if I was already baptized and I'm in a relationship with Christ, right? Um, maybe kind of that, uh, that Baptist doctrine of uh, once saved, always saved, right? If uh, God has me in his hand, nothing will take it from him. I forget exactly what the scripture is. Um, well, I think if, if we really seriously look at ourselves, um, we will see, and I don't think you have to look too hard either, we will see that we, we fall, right? We, we profess to be Christians, we try to do the best that we can to live out the, uh, the law and the gospel, but we always fall short, and, and sometimes we even uh, commit evil, right? So, um, so we, have, we have been forgiven in our baptisms, of original sin, and who, who here knows what original sin is? Call it I, I won't call on you, I promise, but just raise your hand if you've heard of original <laughs> sin before. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping most of you had. Uh, maybe if you don't have uh, as much of a Christian background, you wouldn't know, but original sin is the doctrine that we all have this fallenness uh, to our nature, um, this really crippling fallenness that uh, has tainted us because of the fall of Adam and Eve. So it's a classic story that we all probably know from Genesis, where Eve takes of uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She eats it, gives it to her husband. He, for some reason, thinks it's a good idea to, to eat it too. Um, maybe there's peer pressure, I don't know. But uh, he, he takes of the fruit as well. Humanity falls, everything falls apart. Uh, really, as humans, our, our intellects and our wills are out of whack. We, we do the thing that we don't want to do, we don't do should do, right? Like St. Paul says. Um, but that doesn't get rid of that, right? We're forgiven of that, or if you're older, you're forgiven of your personal sins, which are sins that you've actually committed, um, like lying to your parents about who broke you know, the cabinet in the bathroom. Whatever it is, um, those, are, those are all forgiven. However, something that we Catholics call concupiscence is not forgiven. Okay, who's heard of the word concupiscence? It was in your um, philosophies, if you have those. Can somebody tell me, I will ask you, can somebody <laughs> tell me what concupiscence is, what their understanding is? Tendency to evil. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Tendency to evil, that's, that's all it is. So, I think this is pretty obvious too, like even though we're baptized, we still commit evil, right? Like St. Paul says, that that I should do, I don't, I don't and that that I should not do, I do. So it's very, it's very confusing. But um, he does what he doesn't want to do, he doesn't do what he should do. And that's true for all of us. So, because of this, we still continue to sin. And that brings me to sin. What is sin? We use this word a lot. Who can define sin? Preferably one of the candidates in the kind of community. Sorry, Joe. No one likes the wrong. Okay, no one doesn't like the wrong, he's still doing wrong. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just doing 
wrong. That's the simplest way to put it. The, the catechism, though, in its fancy words, says, an offense against God, reason, truth, and right conscience. So that's the knowing it's yeah, wrong. No. You have your conscience. Your conscience tells you don't do this. You ignore it and do it anyway, right? Um, the catechism goes on to say it's a deliberate thought, word, deed, or failure to do something we should have done. And just so you know, I did kind of paraphrase. But, um, but one thing I think is interesting is that it says sin is an offense against reason. So it's crazy to sin, basically, is what the catechism is saying. Which makes sense, right? Because God created us. He's all good, all loving, uh, all knowing. And we still decide to act against him for some reason. You know, it's very mysterious. Uh, but yes, that's what sin is. It's an offense against, against God. Okay, so now there's two kinds of sin. Mortal and venial sin. So a mortal sin, um, according to the Catechism, it says, uh, or it is a grave infraction of the law of God that destroys the divine life in the soul of the sinner, constituting a turn away from God. Okay, what does that mean? So earlier we said that in baptism we're, we're uh, like our original sin is washed, washed away, right? Another thing that baptism does is it infuses us with sanctifying grace. And that just means that we're put in right relationship with God. Right? God himself comes to live and dwell within us. Well, moral sin gets rid of that. Moral sin kind of he basically says to God, hey, I know I shouldn't be doing this, and, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm pushing you out, God. Right? So he won't save us against, against our will. St. Augustine said, God saved you, or God created you without your permission, but he will not save you without your permission. He respects our free will that much. Um, so we can say no to him, and, and this would be uh, a mortal sin. We, we kick God out of our hearts, out of our souls. So there are three conditions that the, the church outlines for this, okay? So first of all, it has to be great matter, whatever this mortal sin is. Um, have, we have to have full knowledge that it is great matter and it's evil, and, uh, and then give our full consent. So we, we are not coerced in any way. We're forced to do it, right? So um, it's always kind of fun to do some exercises with this. So I'll, I'll just do a couple because unfortunately we don't have so much time. But um, so let's say that um, someone actually I saw this kind of in a movie recently, and I don't know if I should have said that because you never know what kind of movies I watch. But um, <laughs> but there's a character who um, well, there's two characters: a girl and a boy. It's a very bad relationship. There's gang violence and stuff involved. Anyway, the, the boy holds a gun up to the girl's head and he tells her, you need to kill this other innocent person. And if you don't kill this other innocent person, I'm going to kill you. And so, it doesn't happen in the movie, but let's say she did kill that innocent person. Would this be a mortal sin? Joanna? No, why not? Yeah, she was forced to do it. She was under, I think the law calls it duress, right? She was, she was um, forced into doing it. Um, so, okay, so let's take another example then. So let's say someone, um, God forbid, but let's say I have a very sick child who has uh, like cancer or something. And so I decide, well, I'm going to go down to A&B and I'm going to uh, take some weapons and and then take some money that I need to take care of my daughter for her, you know, for her treatments. Um, and so I go in there and I steal all the money in the vault. Would that be a moral sin? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that would be a moral sin because I decided of my own volition to do that, right? Um, and it's, even though you might say, oh, well, it's justified. Well, no, the church would say, no, it's not justified. Um, there are plenty of other ways to come around about getting some money, right? So, so those are just a couple of examples there. Um, so the first one that we talked about with the girl being forced to, to shoot an innocent person, um, that would be called what? What kind of a sin would that be called if it's not moral? Venial. Venial, yeah. So that would be a venial sin, which sounds kind of weird, but, but it would. Uh, because as the church, or as the catechism says, venial sin is sin which does not destroy the, the divine life in the soul as does mortal sin, though it diminishes and wounds him. So it still affects our relationship with God, but not, not to the point of completely kicking him out and 
losing our, our salvation. Right? Uh, venial sin is the failure to observe necessary moderation in lesser matters of the moral law or in grave matters acting without full knowledge or full consent, which in the case of the described it would not be full consent. Right? So, any questions so far? Awesome. So, uh, the distinction that we've been talking about, um, where does it come from? Is it correct to make this distinction, do you guys think? Um, as I said before, the, uh, well, actually, we don't have to find it in the Bible, I guess, but uh, we can actually find the evidence for this distinction in, in the Holy Scriptures. And we will go for that. So I'm do this with my hand. Because if we, if we look at sins, right, um, there seems to be a difference between committing a sin against maybe a stranger or, or someone you're not as close to as opposed to committing a sin to someone you're really close to, right? So if, if I get into a fist fight with my, with my best friend, it's different than like punching my mom in the face, right? If I punch my mom in the face, she's like, what's wrong with you? If I told you oh, I got into a fist fight with my best friend, you're like, oh, okay. I can maybe see doing that. I do like my best friends. I'm not, I'm not, I just brought him in for, for this uh, image. <laughs> okay, so in, in uh, James, oh wait, sorry. I'm in the wrong book. 1 John chapter 5. Sorry, I don't have enough, enough tassels in here. So in 1 John chapter 5, Verse 16, he says, uh, If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a deadly sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin which is deadly. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not deadly. And I mean, depending on the translation you have, sometimes it says moral, sometimes it says deadly, or sin leading to death. Like that, but it's talking nonetheless about moral and venial sin, right? So he says there's sin that's not deadly, which we call venial sin, and there's sin that is deadly, which we call mortal sin. And so even though it seems like, because uh, logic would say, right, as I described, you know, punching your mother versus punching your best friend, well, it seems like there would be a difference for us, right? But maybe logically you could say, well, for God, it's all the same. Just Sin, you sin against God, He's infinite, so therefore the sin would be of infinite value, right? But it's not. The church and, and God Himself has revealed that uh, in His mercy he, he is making this distinction between mortal and venial sins. Hopefully, this all makes sense. I'm sorry, sometimes I get kind of lost in my head. <laughs> um, so, so that's why we make that distinction, right? And, and it also does kind of in a weird way also seem logical. Um, so then, does anybody have any questions on that? Kevin? Adrian, I, I was going to say that this distinction between venial sin and mortal sin is always not really clear. And it's actually a good reason to go to confession. Yeah. Because the priest can help you sort out. Because even the example you gave where the lady went and stole all the money because she was desperate to help her daughter. So, you know, whether she was really culpable because she wasn't in her right mind at the time. She was under duress. Yeah, I mean, it, it, she, yeah. May, she may or may not have been a mortal seal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it can, it can definitely have a lot of gray area. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the, yeah, that's why we um, we're going to watch a little video where we recommend going like every couple of weeks or every month. Um, and, and that's what I try to do just because we, we don't always know whether it is a mortal or venial sin. Um, Oh, and also to, to further explain, so when we commit a mortal sin, I right, mentioned we lose our salvation, we lose the divine life within us. Um, going off of, like based off of uh, 1 John 5, 16, um, we, he says, I do not say that one should pray for, for one who sinned uh, mortally, right? So it's kind of a weird thing to say. He says, don't pray for those who are in mortal sin. Well, what should we do? Um, the tradition... The wisdom of the church has said, well, let's, or we have confession for that. 
So you confess your sins to the priest, and he absolves you of those sins, um, or God does through him, right? So, so that's why we have the sacrament of confession to forgive normal sins. As uh, Deacon Gabe mentioned, uh, venial sins are forgiven in mass. And venial sins are forgiven uh, various ways. You pray for forgiveness. You, um, unfortunately, we don't have holy water right now, but when you go into a church and you bless yourself with holy water, that forgives venial sins. Um, receiving the Eucharist uh, does the same. And uh, I think I'm covering them all. Is that all? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're talking about all that stuff. You have to be sorry for your sins, for all this right. stuff to work. And so he's yeah. talking about that. Yeah, the, uh, mm -hmm. and when, so in uh, uh, Matthew 18, of his verse 31, it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin, this is Jesus speaking, every sin that's blasphemy will be forgiven the people, but blasphemy against the Spirit is not forgiven. And I like to use an example of between Judas and Peter. So when Christ was given up and, and died on the cross, what was the difference between those two guys? They both denied Jesus. They were both willing to turn him over or get away from him. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. So, so why is Peter the rock, the head of the church, and why is Judas not? And so when we talk about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Judas didn't trust God to be able to forgive him. He did something that was unforgivable. So he didn't trust the Holy Spirit, and he despaired and killed himself. Peter, he'd already walked on the water and he trusts God to keep him from drowning. He realized that, that God, Christ, could save him. And so he allowed the Holy Spirit to work in him. And so that when it talks about that in the Bible, if we let the Holy Spirit work in us, uh, then we can be forgiven. And one of the key things is that we also have to forgive. When we do the Our Father's Prayer, we're called to forgive if we want to be forgiven. So you, if you remember the it's in Matthew also, but the, the story of the unforgiving sinner, you know, the debtor, he owed somebody a lot of money, and that guy forgave him his debt. And he left there, and he found somebody that owed him a lesser amount of money, and he had him put in jail until he could pay him back. Of course, the, the, the story goes that they, they found out what he did, and he ended up, basically his family got sold, and he got put in prison until he could pay the debt back. So, so uh, the idea of all this stuff, we have to be an active participant, and we have to trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, thank you, Joe. So, um, yeah, that's something I didn't mention. You do have to have remorse, and you also have to uh, intend not to sin again, right? So when you go to confession and confess something, you shouldn't be back in your mind and think, oh, well, I'll just, you know, go back and be loved this again, or whatever it is, and, and then come back and, and uh, confess it again. You should really, truly intend not to to commit the sin again. Um, and, and that actually will be covered in the, in the short video that I had at the end here. But, uh, but yeah, thank you, Joseph, for mentioning that. Um, and the video will also go over the, the right of confession and how uh, you can, and it'll show an example of how, going, how to go through it. Um, okay. Anybody have any questions so far or comments? Are you going to talk about um, missing masks? In, your, in normal, non-COVID times? Well, uh, I was going to leave things like that for like for later. Uh, moral living or a moral uh, session. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think with morality, you can talk about it for forever. So uh, I'd like to talk about purgatory here and then we can go on to more stuff like that. But, um, <laughs> so um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the double uh, consequences of sin. And so traditionally, so the double consequences of sin, uh, according to the Catholic Church, uh, there's two, two consequences for every time of sin. And so um, I think, well, speaking from my experience as a Protestant, um, sorry, it's hard to, to multitask. Um, I always thought of just one of these consequences, which we talk, which we call uh, in the Catholic Church, the eternal consequence or eternal punishment. Sorry about my handwriting. That's an R, not a B. But um, the eternal consequence of sin would be like hell, right? We, we 
sin. Um, let's just say moral sin. This is to make it easy. So we commit a moral sin. We meet all the criteria. Um, we lose the divine life that's in us. We kick God out. We say no to Him. We, we die spiritually, meaning we go go to hell. God forbid, right? But um, but that would be the, the eternal consequence. Then let's say um, I was that person that stole the, the money from the bank, right? Um, I would probably experience a lot of temporal consequences, right? So this is, these are consequences we experience on earth, um, and then also, if we're not perfectly purified at the time of our death, we would go on to experience in the purgatory. Uh, going back to the example about the bank robbery, if I, if I rob a bank, someone would probably call the cops, right? More than likely to get caught, go to jail. Um, it would be horrible for my family. Um, you know, you can think of tons and tons of, of consequences for that, right? Um, but then, if I if I didn't um, completely purify myself, like if I kept thinking, well, you know, I think I was kind of justified in that. You know, I I really wanted to save my daughter, or I don't know, but whatever it is. Um, then those attachments that I still had to that sin that I committed would have to be purified in um, purgatory. Maybe a more realistic example. Um, so I really love movies, and I love, um, I love sweets. It's not good, but I love both of those things a lot. And I'm pretty sure, you know, while, while maybe um, they're not even mortal sins necessarily, when I, you know, this morning I had waffles with, with maple syrup, I don't think it was sinful for me to eat that, right? Um, but I'm pretty sure I probably have a, a disordered attachment to things like that, right? Um, and, and maybe I have a disordered attachment to, to movies. I think about, well, if I die, what are we going to do up there in heaven, right? Am I going to do I get to watch movies? Do I get to, you know, whatever it is, is it, you guys like basketball or something? Are we going to get to play basketball? I remember in college somebody asked that. Um, and the professor said, no, you won't be able to, but you won't want to. And it's hard for us to imagine that on this side, right? Because we're, we're so attached to these created things that, that we don't realize, that, I mean, we don't realize that we are. Um, but that's what purgatory is for us, to detach us from these things that we are so uh, so like, caught up with here, here on earth, right? So, so if I were to die today, I'd probably have to go through some, some purging of my soul. Uh, but that's why we have things also, like as we for Lent, that's why we have prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, um, especially fasting. When we fast, we really we disconnect or detach ourselves from the things of this world. So let's say we give up, uh, well, as Catholics, we, we don't eat meat on Fridays during Lent, right? At least. So we're, we're detaching ourselves from, from that treat of having meat. So we're, we're detaching ourselves from the, the worldliness of, of food, right? Desire for that, so so that's what um, so that's what purgatory is for uh, in, in taking care of the temporal consequences of sin. Um, yes. Does God send people to hell? So no, God does not send people to hell. As I as I'm trying to emphasize, when we commit a mortal sin, we're kicking God out. We're saying no to Him. As I mentioned before, God will not save us without uh, our permission. He will not force us to be with Him because it would be, it would be worse for us. We would, we would hate it probably more. Like if the devil were in, in heaven, he would absolutely abhor it. Um, so naturally, as a consequence of sin, we, we go to hell or, or we send ourselves to hell. Okay? Um, anything else you can say about that, Joe? Right. It can't be anything else. It's hard for 
us to understand that, because we're both, sometimes we're good and sometimes we're not. And so, so, so it's difficult. Martin? Um, I, I think it would be important to mention, like, in between confessions, uh, I haven't gone to confession in like two weeks, let's say, or whatever. Well, I can't make it this week and I die. Am I going to? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, let's say you confess, and it's been a while since you confessed, and maybe you've committed something you think might be a moral sin, and you get hit by a bus or something. Yeah, would you go to hell? Well, the answer really is we don't know, but um, we do believe in a merciful, loving God, and our Christian life is not based on, you know, whether we're, we're checking off boxes or something, right? It's based on a relationship. So if you're, if you're honestly trying to live the Christian life, um, I mean, I, I would say I do believe that, that God would, would still save you. Uh, however, we should still try to go to confession. Um, there's a movies again. There's a movie called uh, For Greater Glory. It's really good. I recommend it with Andy Garcia. Um, but anyway, there's a character who um, this is set in the Cristiada, which is a time in Mexico when uh, the government was persecuting the Catholic Church. And so uh, Catholics were fighting the government. Um, it was an all-out war. And uh, there's a priest who gets shot in the head, but miraculously I mean, he hasn't gotten a chance to go to confession. Miraculously, he survives long enough to actually confess. Um, so the point with that is just that we should always try to go to confession when we've committed a moral sin or we think we might have. Um, but again, God is merciful, God is just, and, and our, our salvation is based on a, a relationship, not, not just you know, jumping through hoops and stuff. So thank you, thank you for asking that. Well, and also, in order to stay in good standing with the Catholic Church to refuse communion, Eucharist, you yes. have to go at least once a year. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the church does ask us to go to confession at least once a year. So, but we, you know, want to do more than the bare minimum, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and also, if you have committed a mortal sin and you think you need to go to confession, uh, then it's it's right to refrain from receiving the Eucharist. Yes. Does the church believe that unborn babies that were miscarried or whatever, they don't go straight to heaven, they go to purgatory too? Um, I don't think the church teaches anything officially. Uh, do you know some official teaching on that? Yeah, they, they used to teach something called limbo, that babies didn't even go to heaven, they just went to a nice place. The church is teaching today that we uh, uh, we just talked about the sin, you have to know that it's wrong. A baby has no idea whether it sins or not, especially if it hasn't even ever been born yet. And so we believe in the mercy of God that those babies get to go to heaven. We don't know for sure. There's a lot of stuff because there's a lot of mystery and all this stuff. But, but based on the mercy of God and what we understand through Christ and his example to us, a baby who's never done anything purposely against God wouldn't be held. So, so that's why we talk about the age of reason. We don't ask kids that are two years old or five years old or as soon as they can talk to go to confession because they don't understand. Any of you have been around a little kid, you tell them don't do that. and They don't understand right and wrong. You know, they figure out, well, that's do that, I burn my hand, I won't do that again. But, and so they start registering some of those things, but until they can make a, a just decision and understand that they're violating their relationship with God by making these choices, it's not a sin. The whole idea of limbo was just, uh, limbo was supposed to be this state of natural happiness, um, but it was, it was just theoretical and never really officially taught by the church. Um, the theologians now are more leading towards a sign of supernatural happiness, which seems like we're all called to, to have as we're made for God. On, yes. on the, the baby question, um, aren't the all the babies that died when Jesus flew, when they flew to Egypt, yeah. they call them the holy innocents. Right. Yeah, and they talk about that. So those babies died, uh, uh, no fault of their own, they were slaughtered. And so I, I would think you would tie that in also to abortion because those babies were slaughtered or, or a miscarriage or whatever, they died with before, and so if they were called holy innocents, losing their life, I, then I would think that, that that's the tie into they believe the holy innocents are in heaven or they wouldn't call them the holy innocents, yeah. I don't think. So, yeah, I, that's not from the Pope, that's my, that's my <laughs> thinking, but I, I would just connect that if they're called the holy innocents who died um, to, to an underdied, 
that those in the womb would, would be fall under that same banner, I would think. Yeah, I would agree. Um, by the way, if you guys ever hear any of us saying something and then you go and find a church document that says the opposite, believe the church, don't believe us. <laughs> we're, I mean, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can, but it's easy to, you know, sometimes say something wrong or maybe give the wrong impression. So, um, but yeah, I would think uh, if the holy innocents are called the holy innocents, uh, aborted babies and, and miscarried babies would definitely be saved. Uh, another thing that the church does actually teach in uh, Lumen Gentium, it's a document from the Second Vatican Council, so it has very high authority, um, I think the highest that you have, um, but it, it teaches in, I believe it's chapter 14, that those who, who through no fault of their own, have never heard of Christ and never been baptized and you know, essentially not been Christians at all, they have a possibility of being saved if they've earnestly sought the one true God. So if they can be saved, I would say definitely babies can, can be saved who are completely innocent and have no chance at all of ever, ever finding Christianity. So, yeah, that's what I would say. But you know, also, Adrian, like, the Catholic Church doesn't say declare anybody in hell. You know, I mean, there's, yeah. there's hope for everybody. Yeah, and that's one thing. Uh, when Joe was talking about Judas, the church doesn't actually teach Judas is in hell. It seems like he made some bad choices at the end of his life, but we really don't know. Um, and, and it's actually unclear when death actually takes place. You know, we know it's the separation of the soul from the body, but how do you determine that? You know, the soul is invisible. So um, we don't know if there's some final moments where a person could, uh, could, could uh, repent and be saved. So, so yeah, the church does not say anyone's actually in hell. Okay. Uh, so purgatory, I wanted to say a couple more things. Purgatory, um, it's a process more than a place. Okay? So, yeah, well, even heaven and hell uh, are called states by, by the church. Um, and purgatory is more of a process of being purified. Um, an example I like to use is, uh, like, you know, those little toys that toddlers have when they have like, a square-shaped hole and they have to put the square-shaped uh, block in there, right? Well, uh, the uh, purgatory is kind of like getting the, the round piece and trying to push it through, right? And I talked about having attachments to, to sin and attachments to things in this world. Well, you know, if we're not the right shape, if we're not uh, fit to live in heaven, we go through purgatory, which is like if you were to force a circular block through the square peg hole, right? And that's going to be painful for the block. So that's why uh, it's depicted with fire, as you can see over there in the, the picture. Um, and so, so that's why it's painful, and that's why uh, we talk about purgatory as being the church suffering. Um, and that's also why we talk about doing things like prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, which is suffering, right? It's being uncomfortable um, for the sake of God, for the sake of uh, growing in love for God and others. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that? Does that make sense to everybody? So real quick, I wanted to say, uh, purgatory in the Bible, you can look at uh, two Maccabees. Uh, second Maccabees. Verse 12, verses 41 to 45. Um, and we have Judas Maccabeus. Uh, but he's praying for some fallen soldiers uh, so that they're dead, but uh, he still is praying for them. And uh, I'll put that call down. Um, so that's, that's the first place really we, we, that I can think of, I guess, that uh, we see something like purgatory, uh, or alluding to purgatory, or some state between this life and, and heaven. Then we have, uh, actually, Joe mentioned it. Two, where Jesus talks about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He says it's not forgivable either in this life or this age or the age to come. Uh, so the church is also taking this to the age to come to mean well, there's something um, between here and in heaven where we can be forgiven of sins. Uh, so purgatory again. The best, um, the best verse uh, that really convinced me when I was coming into the church is First Corinthians. 
to 15. Um, I'm not going to read it because we don't have a whole lot of time, but, but this I think is a really good one. And in, in St. Paul talking about um, the foundation being laid, which is Christ, and then uh, our works um, being built upon that. And he talks about you can build on this foundation of Christ with uh, jewels, which would be good works, straw, which would be evil works. Sorry to do this to you, but then I'm going to mention indulgences and then move right along. So, um, uh, hopefully Deacon Dave will, will touch on indulgences again next week. But um, this temporal punishment that we've been talking about, that we, this purification that happens in purgatory, um, this is what indulgences remove. Okay, so this year by, has been uh, declared by Pope Francis to be the year of St. Joseph. So he's granted plenary indulgences for, for a list of things. Um, there's a handout over there that hopefully you picked up with, with a bunch of the things that you can do. Uh, some of them are like meditating on Our Father for at least 30 minutes, participating in a spiritual retreat. With, uh, it includes meditation on St. Joseph, um, reciting the Holy Rosary as a family or between husbands and wives, and among others. And, and then there's also, oh gosh, I forgot to put in the, uh, the I think there's three requirements for doing indulgence. You have in a state of grace. You have to go to Eucharist. Uh, Eucharist. Yeah. Normally you have to go on a pilgrimage of some sort, so there's got to be some kind of a normal pilgrimage. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to include that in there. Um, so, so those are the things, uh, those are indulgences, and that's what they take care of. They take care of a temporal punishment that, you know, being purified and being fit to, to enter heaven. The other one is you have to go to confession. Yeah, so you have to be in a state of grace, you have to go to confession. Show that video. It's only about six minutes, um, and then I might just show the uh, video for anointing the sick. I have a little more discussion than I planned, but uh, but I'm, that's great. So uh, I wanted to let you guys know: those of you who were baptized, then you will actually go to your first confession, um, and I don't have a date yet for that, but uh, but you'll go to your first confession sometime probably in Lent, and and so. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, between now and then, I will try to print out like a guide for confession. I didn't have time to do that this week, but, but I do want to print out a guide for you. Um, and that is our confessional. So that's where Father sits. And right now during COVID, we can't sit right next to him, so we we'll sit over there in the opposite corner in that chair that we see in the corner. Sorry for the darkness there. But, um, but yeah, that's the confessional. Um, so if you haven't seen it before, to have some pictures for you. Um, any questions? This video will kind of go through the uh, uh, the rite of confession uh, towards the end, I think. So, so hopefully you enjoy it. Saturday at 4 p.m. While their neighbors relax and enjoy the day, we can see Catholics gathering to cleanse themselves of sin in the Sacrament of Reconciliation, also known as Confession. What a great way to observe their natural behavior. Oh, it looks as if we have a particularly nervous penitent. Not surprising. This is the sacrament that Catholics hate before, but love after. Hi, I'm Libby. And I'm Kai. Welcome to Catholic Central. In this episode, we're going to talk about one of the most misunderstood practices in the Catholic Church, the Sacrament of Reconciliation. People also call it the Sacrament of Conversion, the Sacrament of Forgiveness, and the Sacrament of Penance. But you may know it by its more common name, Confession. Okay, so you may get a little uncomfortable when you hear that word. Detailing all the ways in which you've failed yourself and others might not exactly be your idea of a good time. But for Catholics, confession can bring healing, peace, and a kind of joy and inner freedom they can't experience any other way. So most people know that confession, the sacrament of reconciliation, is something that Catholics do. But it really points to a universal reality that all people have. There are times when every single person does things they regret says things they wish they had not said, or hold on to an attitude that makes life miserable. There is a universal human longing to bring our darkness to the light, to be made whole, and to become our true selves. As universal as that might be, though, the first question you might ask is, why do it this way? You might say, 
isn't it much easier to confess my sins directly to God? You don't have to leave the house or even put on pants. It's a great question. Nothing stops anyone from communicating directly with God. The church hopes you do, but there is value in speaking to another human being, one who will keep confidentiality and receive the confession with a sense of reverence. And saying something out loud can take away its power. Sin loves to stay secret. It can grow and deceive that way. Another reason Catholics do what they do is because they recognize that sin doesn't just affect your relationship with God. As early as the third century, it became obvious to the Christian community that serious sins like apostasy, murder, and adultery affected everyone. So back then, penitents. People who had publicly sinned. Would make a public confession and hang out their dirty laundry in front of everyone. Then do acts of penance everybody could see. That didn't go over so well. Yeah, they stopped doing that. But there was still an awareness that others were affected by sin. Problem is, you can't go to every single person on earth and apologize. For us, the priest represents the entire community, the body of Christ. Saying you're sorry to him is like saying you're sorry to the whole group. So now your next question might be, wait, why does a priest get to do that? Catholics believe the authority comes from Jesus himself, who gave it to the apostles, who handed it down to the priests all the way here to today. John 20 explains. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So whenever Catholics confess to a priest, he represents Jesus Christ, who gave him the authority to absolve us. And to absolve comes from the word to set free. Confession releases us from our sins and puts us back in right relationship with God, others, and ourselves. Even the famous psychologist Carl Jung believed in the curative power of confessing wrongs and receiving absolution from a person sanctioned to give it. He often asked new patients if they were Catholic. If they said yes, he sent them to confession first. Some of the patients never came back because confession took care of whatever was bothering them. But it's important to know that confession is not therapy. It's a sacrament that washes away sins. And it's not magic either. You have to do your part. There are three things required for a Catholic confession to be valid. One, contrition. You have to be genuinely sorry for your sins. So no doing whatever you want and using confession as a get out of jail free card. Two, you have to confess your sins out loud to a priest in person. And three, satisfaction. You have to perform whatever penance the priest prescribes. Remember, penance is not a way to earn forgiveness. Instead, it's an opportunity to pause a moment to consider the seriousness of sin and to accept the mercy of God who forgives and transforms. Which brings us to the question, what actually happens during a confession? Let's return to our penitents in their natural habitat. In this case, a booth. But penitents are known to choose other places where they can talk to a priest privately. Oh, our nervous penitent hasn't run away. He'll probably choose the door that has a screen for privacy. But oh, he chose the face-to-face -face option. Fascinating. He starts by saying when his last confession was. One year. We're in for a rare treat. Now come the sins. Our penitent is doing an excellent job at confessing his own sins and not blaming his family or mean neighbors. Now for a few words of advice or encouragement from the priest. And here's the penance. It might be a prayer or some act of service. Whatever the priest feels will be the most helpful for the penitent to grow closer to God. Next, the act of contrition. Here the penitent expresses in prayer that he's truly sorry for his sins and intends to avoid them in the future. I see the penitent has chosen the act of contrition printed on a card in the confessional. Classic. But now the most exciting part, the prayer of absolution, declaring the penitent's sins absolved in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. After that, the penitent goes in peace. So how often does the church say he should go to confession? The church recognizes the importance of individual conscience. You usually know when you've done something your way and not God's way, and it's time for confession. <laughs> Formally, Catholics should receive the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, at least once a year. And to do that, serious sins should be confessed beforehand. But when you need to go to confession, go. I personally tend to go every couple of weeks, or sooner if I have something I've said or done weighing on me, or need to get something off my chest. Like when you feel guilty for eating someone else's lunch? How did you know about that? You told me this morning. Oh, yeah, phew, I was worried the priest had broken the seal of the confessional. He can't. Every priest is sworn to uphold it. Even secular courts all over the world recognize this, and by law, they can't force a priest to reveal anything he's been told in confession. So, my secrets are safe with the priest, even if I blab about them. Yep. Plus, the priest is likely hurt at all, so don't worry about shocking him. Speaking of shocking, you may have heard stories about confessions that were less than stellar. Unfortunately, it's true. Priests are people too, and sometimes particular ones haven't been the most kind or helpful in the confessional. If you've had a bad experience or you're afraid to go, ask someone to recommend a priest who's known for his compassion and wisdom. It's like Pope Francis said, the confessional is not a torture chamber, but the place in which the Lord's mercy motivates us to do better. 
as he leaves the booth. That spring in his step and big smile are sure signs of joy. I'm Libby. And I'm Kai. See you next time on Catholic Central. Uh, but one thing I did forget to mention was the seal, the seal of confession. Uh, yeah, the priest, whatever you confess in confession, the priest cannot share with anybody for any reason, like they said, even uh, like to police. So, so for example, the bank, bank robber thing, uh, if I confess that in confession, um, the priest would not be able to read it to anyone or read it to anyone. He wouldn't even be able to bring it up to me. So after your confession, you can't, like, the priest can't even bring it up to you. Like, hey, remember when you said you did that sin? You know, why are you doing it again? Or, like, he can't say anything unless you bring it up to him and you want to talk about it. So, uh, so that's always a good comfort. Um, and... You might mention this penance for somebody who stole money you might need to take it back. Um, well, did, he, did he do that? It could be. Because I know, like, if, if someone, like, confesses murder... They will, the, the penance can't be turn yourself in, but they can encourage that, and they probably will. Uh, but I don't know if you can. Do you think you would do that? I don't know. Well, the idea is that you're making restitution for yourself. But yeah, <laughs> uh, most of the time it's prayers or, or doing uh, good things for others. At least that's what I've got. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. It's hard to do two sacraments in one hour. I guess we'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you guys the, the uh, anointing of the sick video, um, and then we'll call it a day. It's about five minutes, so I'm sorry to keep you a little bit late. Adrian, there's uh, the preacher's mass is the same. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, so I guess I can go ahead and do the announcement. So there's a teaching mass this uh, afternoon or evening at 5 p.m. It will be recorded if you can't make it, but I encourage you guys to go. Um, I also need baptism certificates if you guys brought them to me today. Thank you for that. Um, I think there's still a few others that I need. Uh, the right of election, I wanted to give you a heads up about. It's February 21st at 1.30. Um, I will email you all the details on that, but that's going to be at St. Mary's Cathedral, which means we're going to have the right of sending here, uh, which is just it's a simple right again, but, um, but sponsors and catechumens have to be candidates have to be here uh, at 8.30. I do have to confirm that with Father, but I uh, usually do the 9 a.m. Mass for the Rite of Sending. Um, so, but yeah, we'll have the Rite of Sending here at St. Anne's, 9 a.m., and then the uh, Rite of Election, uh, actually it's at 2.30 on February 21st, but you guys have to be there at 1.30, so usually it's still at 1.30. Okay, so here's uh, the Sacrament of Anointing of the Sick. Uh, sorry for the rush. Um, but I think they do a pretty good job, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Oh, yes, Marjorie. I can't wait to have this cataract removed. <laughs> Hello, Bernice. Father. I came to see if you'd like to receive anointing of the sick. Last rites. Am I dying? No, no, no. <sighs> Not yet. Welcome to Catholic Central. I'm Libby. And I'm Kai. What do you do when someone gets sick? Lie to my boss about having to take care of them so I can get out of work. Or pray for them? Oh, of course. Jesus encouraged people to turn to him for healing. And the Catholic Church takes Jesus at his word. In addition to private prayers, for serious conditions, there is even a sacrament of healing. Otherwise known as the Catholic Sacrament of Anointing of the Sick. People may ask, is it a magic spell to cure diseases? Is it some type of faith healing where people pray instead of seeking treatment? Is it a multi-level marketing scheme for extremely overpriced essential oils that do nothing? No and no, respectively. Anointing of the sick is a ritual through which God connects with us and reminds us that he's present in our lives. Even Catholics can be confused about this right. Am I dying? Which comes from the fact that most Catholics have never seen it in person. It is most often celebrated in private settings with small groups of people. It's the quieter, more introverted sacrament. So when would Catholics go beyond just praying for healing and ask for the sacrament? If there is a serious illness, a change in a chronic condition, upcoming surgery, or even if an illness has become difficult to bear. Like if a person is hit with severe depression or feels the effects of aging. You can go to the parish, call and ask for a priest to come to you, or if you're in the hospital, ask for the priest on call. 
You should tell people when it's happening so then maybe they'd actually show up to visit their old sick relative. <coughs> Once there, the priest may ask if the sick person wants to speak privately for a moment. Sometimes people want to confess. After that is completed, they have time to talk. Ideally, family members, close friends, and even caregivers will be part of it. Ideally. The priest will often ask about the illness and comfort the people gathered. Then the really sacramenty part. The priest puts on a stole and prays from the ritual book. There are several versions of the rite, longer and shorter, to accommodate the needs of the patient. You don't want to have an hour-long rite for someone who is in great pain or discomfort. In the basic rite, there is an opening prayer and then often a little penitential rite asking forgiveness. You know, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, like at the beginning of Mass. Then the priest lays hands on the person's head and they pray silently. This follows Jesus' practice of laying hands on the sick. The priest then takes a vial of oil, special olive oil that's been blessed, usually by a bishop, called, obviously enough, oil of the sick. He says a prayer and rubs a cross of oil on the person's forehead and then on each palm. In Jesus' time, it was common to anoint sick people and their wounds. But the practice was not just physical medicine. Olive oil was a symbol of the blessing of God. Then the priest leads whoever is gathered in praying the Our Father, followed by a closing prayer. The family members and priests themselves I have often talked about how the right brings peace and sometimes even physical relief from suffering. So you might be asking, what about last rites? Am I dying? No, you're fine. Last rites is one of the forms of the sacrament for people who are possibly near death. The rite is a little more involved and also includes confession, readings from the Bible, renewal of baptismal promises, and the Eucharist. Which, in this case, has a neat Latin name, viaticum, hmm. meaning provision for the journey into the next life. Now, some people wonder, well, what about people who die unexpectedly and never get anointing of the sick? Do they need it to get into heaven? Fortunately, the answer is a definite no. Anointing of the sick is a help and comfort to a dying person, but there's no reason to worry about the soul of someone who didn't receive it. So, to sum up, during anointing of the sick, a priest visits a sick person to pray with them and their families. The priest lays his hand on the sick person and uses blessed oil to, surprise, anoint them. The ritual isn't a substitute for medicine, but expresses our desire for physical healing and prepares us to receive whatever kind of healing we need. Whether physical or spiritual, serious illness can be a frightening and confusing experience in itself. But if people are feeling guilty about where they've gone wrong in their life, the anointing can help them feel God's love and mercy. And maybe even healing. For Catholic Central, I'm Libby. And I'm Kai. Till next time, thanks for watching. One thing I'd like to add, not a question, but being a hospice nurse, we have you know last rites all the time. And some families don't know whether their loved ones have received it or not. And the priest will actually give you a certificate of anointing. Yeah, I think uh, one of the main things is that it doesn't always mean, though, that it's the last rites like they were saying, right? So, um, Father, Father Scott did anointing recently. Um, I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic, maybe? maybe? Um, does anybody remember? Okay. Um, no, I don't remember. Oh, okay. I was going to mention that. <laughs> but uh, at the hospitals, both hospitals in Amarillo, they, there's a priest that's on call. So you can, if you're just laying in there sick or whatever, about to have surgery, you can ask the nurse to call the priest, and hopefully he's readily available. Sometimes it takes him a while, but the the priest can come and give you an anointing at any point, even in the ER. Uh, and you can even request. I've often had call them in the ER and have them yeah. anoint somebody. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did want to, uh, one of the things that the handout talked about that what you really mentioned there is that sometimes it's anxiety and mental uh, stress on your body uh, would be a reason that you would have anointing of the sick. So you may not be uh, uh, sick that a doctor is taking care of, but if you have some issues that are making you feel weighted down or heavy, that the, the priest can or give you the anointing of the sick. So if you have any questions about that, And you get that anointing more than once, too. Yes, yeah, you can be a, So, yeah, like a, an example would be like if you got COVID, you can, you know, well, actually, I don't know how the final protocol would be, but you can probably get anointed. Um, I think that's why Father did it. Uh, 
<clears throat> but yeah, he's already had it, so he could be all right. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how he would do that. But, uh, but if it's a serious illness, you know, it's, like, it's not like, oh, okay, I have a cold, uh, I need to go into the city. That would be something a little more serious, right? Like pneumonia or, or something like that. It doesn't mean you have to be dying, but uh, it should be kind of serious. If you can be old age, too, like if someone is, you know, I don't know, 80 years old, they have some uh, medical problems, they're not close to death necessarily, if you'd like to get going to the camp, too. Or something. Uh, I wanted to direct you guys to your uh, Notes of the Sick pamphlets. Uh, please read through these. There's a section especially on suffering, uh, the value of suffering as Christians. Um, you know, Jesus suffered and died, and that saved the entirety of the human race. Uh, so as Christians, we, we are little Christs, right? So we participate in Christ's mission, and so suffering has a new meaning uh, for Catholics. We can, uh, like I said before, we can, we can uh, use it as something that purifies us. And we can offer it up for ourselves and for others. Um, but yeah, so just look through that. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Again, I apologize. Um, I tend to go along with these things. Uh, but it was, there's a lot to talk about. So um, I guess I'll leave you with that. We'll, we'll go ahead and um, close in prayer. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Oh, I did want to say I'm not going to be here actually. Uh, I mean, I'll be around, but I won't be here uh, leading for the next month. Uh, class I need to give for the youth, so I'll be doing that, um, but I will be, you know, walking back and forth like I usually do, um, and if you need me, you can always call me or, or email me. Okay, let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Father, remind us that we can always come to you when we are suffering. Your Son experienced human suffering in a profound way, and so knows what it is to suffer. Help us to suffer well and commend our sick to you with our prayers and by caring for them. We ask that you comfort those who are afflicted by disease in our parish, our nation, and our world. We ask that you bring an end to the COVID pandemic. And above all, we ask you to free us from the illness of sin, that we might be able to enter into eternity with you. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Luke, pray for us. St. Helena, pray for us. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. By the way, at the end there, there's some intercession, so we can ask the saints to pray for you. Uh, the sponsor that told you about that, but um, it's always a cool thing to do, and it shows the community.